Hi guys, how is everybody doing today? Um, I've got Christoph here back again, very kindly to give us another chess lesson. Uh, some of you will remember that Christoph came on to give me a lesson on the panel of attack in the Karakan just before I went away to the Olympiad. Uh, and today we are doing the, the Spanish, doing the Ruy Lopez because it's an opening that I am looking to be learning soon. And uh, it turns out Christoph is also writing a course on it. So it's really good timing. Um, Thank you, yeah, Christoph, for coming absolutely. back. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, I'm currently working on a, on a new chess level course, which should be out around Christmas. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm lagging a little bit some, some days uh, behind my scheduling. So it's, it's a bit tricky, but it's going to be um, a second edition of my Keep It Simple 1E4 course, which originally came out uh, almost five years ago. And I'm doing a new version and this um, new version, the second edition will actually feature the Royal Pass for white and that kind of fits pretty well. Right? So we are going to go through a little bit um, this opening, but also about some basic ideas of the opening, not like I'm not going into like um, 20, uh, 20 move theory or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's not the focus here, but rather why is the Royal Lopez a good opening and what is the idea actually uh, the set of ideas behind it so that's um, the main thing so it's good if you don't really have any background knowledge so you're kind of starting from scratch here I think right yeah I basically know up to um like bishop bishop b5 <laughs> um, okay so it's uh I I know that um we're looking at um not we're not looking at the exchange that's what I know uh but I I also know that um it's like one of if not the oldest like chess opening so there's a lot of theory <laughs> and um yeah I have yeah no idea of like real ideas in this opening or anything like that yeah I, I, we'll we'll get there and I think we will actually start from a very basic point uh, here even even with 1e4 it's something that you can talk about just like from the very very first move because mm -hmm. the the concept of the Rui is actually um, a pretty deep one and not so easy to grasp if you are not starting from the very first move actually mm -hmm. um, if, if we start right here with 1e4 mm -hmm. you can actually talk about the very basic idea that white has and it's actually just to play d4 next i know it sounds super basic now but we want the full pawn center so if black is not really reacting in any way playing something some small move that doesn't do much white will go d4 right yeah. so let's say i'm just making a move i'm not going to act like this yeah black doesn't do anything we're happy to play d4 and in a way, we have already won the opening battle because we have the two center pawns that cannot be attacked that easily. Okay, a6 is a silly move, but just just the very basic idea that white um, wants to have the full pawn center and ideally keep the pawns on e4 and d4. Maybe we can advance them, but we don't want to have them like split or removed so that we keep both e and d pawn to cover, I'm trying to paint here, I hope oh, that was not intended, uh, trying to keep all those squares under control. Mm -hmm. And if you go back here, you can actually look at the openings here that, that Black now can choose from. You can sort them into different tiers if you want. Like you have two moves that stop d4. And okay, theoretically speaking, there's also knight f6, which attacks the pawn when white has to somehow react yeah this is a kind of an outlier because the pawn is hanging we advance that that's Alakan's defense but yeah. if you look at all the other openings that black can play um they actually either stop d4 or they don't mm -hmm. so you have e5 or c5 and it is not um, a coincidence that those two moves the sicilian and e5 that these are the most popular moves that's not uh, random it's because they say eh, hey, you don't get d4 and it's also not a coincidence if you look at the absolute top players like look at magnus carlsen if you look at all his games and you mm -hmm. could do that at the thousands then 
he plays e5 or c5 in 80 to 90 percent of them he really very rarely does something else he sometimes plays um, other stuff to surprise people or in blitz or something like that but if it's really 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 serious he plays e5 or c5 if you look at all the world championship games for example that he played he has only once or twice i think he, he played one c6 in a game against mm -hmm. vichy once and everything else is e5 or c5 so um people are really reluctant to allow d4 which doesn't say that e6 or or c6 that these are bad openings they're just different because they give white the full center so when black goes e5 here they say you're not easily getting the full center and this is now a thing that white um, has to consider do we want with white fight for this full center like having a pawn on d4 and keeping it on d4 if white wants to do that it's actually difficult to accomplish it's really difficult yeah. if you think about it um if white goes d4 now then black takes on d4 like i mean just just very basic they mm -hmm. take and i mean white can take with the queen but it's clearly not going to be e4 d4 that pawn duo that white wants the same thing happens if white starts with knight f3 and they play knight c6 when we are getting closer to the Ruler Lopez. Like if you're here and white wants the full pawn center, how would you accomplish that? Like if you want a pawn on d4, like I mean, I can really make that make a question out of that. Let's say you want a pawn on d4 and want to keep it. What would be the move? Um, to keep it on d4. Yeah, so you want a pawn play to d4 and if they take, we ideally want to recapture with a pawn so, so that C3. there are two pawns. Exactly. That, that is actually a real opening that's called the Ponziani opening. It's a pretty rare opening, okay. but it's a real opening. It has a name. It has a history. Mm -hmm. um, by, by the way, um, I try to read the chat, but it's kind of difficult for me <laughs> because no, I'm looking it. at... Yeah, I, I read it a little bit, and uh, if it's really, really important, mm -hmm. like... Maybe you you can give me the yeah if the there info are, from the chat. Um, mm? Yeah, if there are like specific questions, I will ask. Yeah, I've, I've got it. I've yeah, got it here on the screen, but it's a little bit <laughs> too too much for me to follow at the same time. So, like C three is a thing. It's a it's an opening uh, called like as I say the Ponziani. Now, mm -hmm. this opening, however, has a real drawback. It has several drawbacks actually, but we can go go to one drawback. And that is Black's best move. That is the move d5. And I just want to show you the problem here. Black is immediately attacking the pawn. Mm -hmm. And white, um, white can try all kinds of things now. But whatever happens, we have to do something with the e-pawn. So mm -hmm. white has to take or has to resort to some kind of tactic here. Like there are ideas like queen a4, that uh, very tactical stuff, but mm -hmm. you just don't get the time to play the pawn to d4. You don't get that time because black plays this d5 move and is basically first to attack us here in the center. The mm -hmm. problem is that the move c3 was a bit too early. If we go back here, it's difficult for black to play d5 as long as we have this knight c3 move just like we're just making a move that that doesn't make all that much sense like i'm making this one and here d5 wouldn't really work because white could attack the queen and black would lose time for no reason that makes no sense so the move c3 is actually a little bit too early because it allows this d5 move like e takes queen takes Black actually is fine because white cannot attack the queen and it's sitting yeah. pretty nicely in the middle of the board. So this is why c3 is not such a great idea. If white wants to get this in, like c3 and d4, then they have to be a little bit more, a little bit more cunning. You have to be a little bit more sophisticated about it. This would work if black now plays something stupid. Let's say black plays something, I know, like d6 or so. And then d4 and everything's great we have a great center and if black ever decides to take we recapture and have a great central control so that is the dream thing that we want 
And this is the reason why C3 is not so great and why try something else. So if we want to get this in, the C3D4, what else could Y do? Some things are immediately out of, um, let's say, uh, contention for, for accomplishing this. For example, if you would play like D4, it's already out because black can take. We don't yeah. have a pawn on C3. Or if you play knight C3, which is not a bad move, but well, we, we need the pawn there. So there are not that many possible options, actually. And this leads us to the fact that the two most popular moves here are bishop c4 and bishop b5. Yeah. The Italian and the, and the Rue Lopez. So what White is basically saying is, oh, I want this c3d4 ideally, but I cannot do it right away. I need to first get the bishop in the game to c4 or to b5 and then see if I can get the c3d4 in later. Mm -hmm. And now, we have to look at the difference between the Italian and the Rue Lopez. They actually share some characteristics and some positions can be very similar, but the, the set of ideas is a bit different in some cases. So if we look at Bishop C4 first, mm -hmm. the main replies for black now are Knight F6 and Bishop mm -hmm. C5. And this is also not random. It makes a lot of sense that those moves are correct because with knight f6, black is attacking the pawn. And mm -hmm. of course, I'm not sure if you probably have looked at this at some point because it's in many books. There's this knight g5, that fried liver yeah, attack. Yeah, the fried and, liver stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that, it's very tactical and very concrete yeah. as white is attacking f7. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's the line. But yeah. if we exclude this one, which is a very specific idea, like white mm -hmm. tries this immediate attack and it's gambit play. If we exclude this one for a moment and think about the full center that we want, that is a problem here in knight f6 because our pawn is attacked. Mm -hmm. And how do we cover that? The only way to cover the pawn in a, in a sensible way is like d3, mm -hmm. cover it with the pawn. Like knight c3, possible theoretically but doesn't work with this c3d4 idea yeah yeah so if we still want c3d4 we probably have to play d3 and that's kind of not ideal because we would like c3d4 in one go mm -hmm. not spend two moves with the d-pawn so this is of course not a bad opening for white but we see that Black with the immediate attack has accomplished something. They actually have slowed down this idea. And sometimes white can still play d4, but it will take a while. So here will black plays this one usually, and then white castles. And later white can try with this slow approach, like one move slower than that, than that was originally intended. Mm -hmm. Black can also go bishop c5, and again, not random, they, they, they look at the d4 square to make it more difficult for white to get c3, d4 in. So white can try that here again, like play c3 and go for d4. And now again, the next move is, is almost forced. Black has to attack e4 and get some counterplay. And if white now goes d4, we get to a very, very old opening that has been analyzed by like Greco in the 16th century. Oh, really? they're, 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 they're really, um, really old um, analysis there. And it's really good. He really was a great tactical player. One of those, I think he's Greco, which means like Greek, but I think he's from Italy, actually, if I'm not mm -hmm. wrong. And he analyzed pretty nice stuff like Gambit play after this. Like here, they played knight c3 and offered the pawn, very tactical stuff. But you see in all those lines, like here, the pawn center does not, um, it's not maintained. It's not, it doesn't stay on the board because black has this immediate counterplay against the pawn. Or here, sorry, after the check, white can also do this. And then black manages d5 and attacks those two. And again, we cannot keep the pawns. So it is really difficult to get the, the two pawns installed in the middle of the board. 
So this is the Italian. And now let's have a look at um, Rui Lopez in comparison. So a difference between the two is, of course, that the bishop is not at all looking at the f7 pawn. Mm -hmm. So if we compare, this is a little bit more directly aggressive, so to say, yeah. because there is a pressure on f7. And we have like the fried liver as an example, where this is an immediate attack on that pawn. That is, of course, not the case with the Rui. The bishop is on b5. And that does two things, mostly two things. It puts an indirect pressure on the e5 pawn. That is a difference to the Italian. Because if white manages at the right moment to take the knight, we might mm -hmm. win the e5 pawn. That is a yeah. first difference. So black has to be a little bit observant about this. I mean, usually they manage to keep the pawn, but if you look at a whole range of games, like if you look at, for example, a database of online games and you have like tens of millions of games actually with the Rui, you see many games where black is directly concerned about the e5 pawn and plays something pretty passive, like pawn to d6, for example, and keeps mm -hmm. this covered, which this is a very passive move. Yeah. Against that would actually manage to get a full pawn center because that is so passive. Mm -hmm. So there is an indirect pressure on e5 because we can operate with this idea of taking on c6 and take on e5. That's one thing. But the second and actually more important point is that we are lining up this bishop against the king, which means it's not a mean of uh, the idea is not like an attack on the king, but having the bishop on b5 makes it more difficult for black to play the pawn to d5. So if you just think about this in the Italian game, black sometimes manages the pawn to d5. If we go here, um, like going back to this variation. That is a very good example for that. When they can play d5, the bishop is on c4. And the same idea, playing a quick d5, is very difficult to accomplish if the bishop is on b5. Um, for example, if black plays the same move, like bishop c5, as they do in the Italian, mm -hmm. it's a different story. We can play c3, knight f6, and go for d4 here. As here, white can start a direct attack with e5. The same position, almost the same position, is possible in the Italian. Let me put that on the board just to compare this because it's really important, like this, this, oops, sorry, c3, knight of 6 oops, d4, take e5, e5, and they have d5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's super important. That's a tempo. Mm -hmm. And if the bishop is on b5, that doesn't work. In fact, this particular thing is pretty difficult for black to play. That, that's not a good variation. Bishop c5 is actually it's not completely terrible, but it's kind of dubious. And mm -hmm. this is an interesting fact, I think, that such a normal looking move is actually pretty dubious. Bishop c5 yeah. looks like a completely normal um, normal development move, but the c3, d4 idea now is much more dangerous. And in fact, here, black cannot really prevent it anymore. Like we get this pawn to d4, and due to this bishop being better positioned here, um, it's very nice for white. They, they cannot play that, let's say, naively. Black has to be a little bit more cunning there. And many continuations that don't really fight against the c3d4 um, are very nice for white. So you sometimes see, as I said, so d6 moves like that. And this is very nice. You just get the full pawn center. Um, 
So you have have do you, uh, did you ever look at any games in the Roy or nothing at all? Like even like Grandmaster games when you watch a broadcast or stuff like that? I've definitely seen it played in top level events, but mm -hmm. I can't say I remember any particular games. Yeah. Um, okay. No, that's that's fine. So we can talk about what Black usually does here because mm -hmm. um, you can more or less um, let's say make two groups of replies and you can also say that one group is good and the other is not in a way yeah? so the the best way for black to play is try to fight with with everything they have um this c3d4 idea if white gets this in it's going to be comfortable mm -hmm. so there are a number of replies that are not so great when white manages that and I mean, they are playable. It's not like they're terribly bad and you have games by, by good players with those lines, but they, they are risky because white gets the full pawn center. I can make an example, um, something like G6, for example, where black tries to fianchetto the bishop that has been played by strong players. For example, by Magnus, he has played that in some games, okay. um, but mostly to, to get something different and for surprise value. Mm -hmm. Here, white can get the full center. And mm -hmm. this is a risky opening because very nice pawns and black has to be worried that we push further or just get um, full control of those central squares. This is all pretty risky. And there are more moves like that. Um, I already showed this a little bit when white also gets C3D4. It's also risky for black. So what is probably best for black fighting against c3d4 and how would black do that do you have an idea what black could do just conceptually to make it more difficult for white to play c3d4 um well i know that um black often plays a6 because mm -hmm. i guess the bishop the placement of the bishop is one of the main things which is preventing black from um you know having that kind of option to play d5 later uh, as they maybe would in the italian or another opening so a6 um i mm -hmm. guess forces white to make a decision of some kind yeah exactly black has black has two main continuations that's a6 Mm -hmm. And like if you if you would have asked people like 25 years ago, uh, they would have said there's just only a6 more or less and the rest is kind of kind of uh, whatever yeah this kind of um, the rest is like odds and ends or so to say. So everybody played a6. It mm -hmm. has all changed a little bit in the last like say 20, 25 years when the Berlin defense is knight of six move, which is yes. often uh, often seen uh, when this come uh, came to more more prominence. Um, so nowadays we can say that there are two main moves, it's a6 mm -hmm. and knight f6. However, if you look at like amateur games or like the whole, um, let's say, not just look at the very top level, um, you see all kinds of continuations. Like if you, you would play the Roy and you play it against like um, your typical uh, opponents, they would play all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. don't expect um, the Berlin to be played like every game. It's actually relatively rarely seen on the amateur level. It's kind of surprising, but uh, the top guys, they have figured this out. It's a good move and it's played a lot, but not so much on lower levels. And in some cases, um, people know that even good theoreticians know that the Berlin is a good line. But some of the um, arising positions tend to be a bit boring. That's not super relevant for us now, but that also is kind of uh, yeah putting people off sometimes of the of the move. Mm -hmm. For example, with black, I have played um, this position, like the black side of the Roy. I'm not sure, like dozens of times in tournament mm -hmm. chess. And I haven't played knight f6 all that often because I just felt bored myself, even though I know it's a good move and I don't really didn't play it all that often. So the idea of knight f6 and actually also of a6, bishop mm -hmm. a4, we get to this in a minute why bishop a4 and not the capture. Um, here again, it's kind of a6, bishop a4 is kind of an 
Like we inserted those moves, but the question remains the same. What should black do now? The most popular and likely best move is knight f6, which is kind of similar to the Berlin actually. It's just like a6 and bishop a4 is, is flicked in. That that makes a, that is a change, but it's um conceptually the same thing. Black plays a counterattack against the pawn and says, okay. How do you get this c3d4 in now as the pawn is hanging? Um, before we get there, just a word about this a6 move. Because mm -hmm. what about this? Isn't that winning a pawn? That's a very important question to ask. Because after bishop takes, black actually takes with the d pawn. That's important, not with the b mm -hmm. pawn. And the reason is that now white cannot grab the pawn as queen d4 is good it's super ah. important otherwise a6 would be a kind of a blunder yeah but mm -hmm. this is the the reason why white cannot just win a pawn mm -hmm. and here um black is already a little bit better because black has the two bishops which is nice and so something like this is kind of the best that white can get and it's it's really kind of depressing yeah <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, that, that's you don't want that. No, so not not a good idea. I mean, the capture on c6 in itself is not bad. It's a viable line, but mm -hmm. after this, um, White would do something else. Usually, mm -hmm. they would castle or knight c3, uh, some something like that. But it's yeah. conceptually again completely different. It's not like White tries to play this later or so. It's just like. Mm -hmm. They take here and usually play for an advantage in development because white is a bit better developed here. But I think you already said to me uh, when we talked about this lesson that you never, you don't want to take there, but rather want to keep the bishop, right? Yeah, I want to keep the bishop. I want to be one of those people who's good with the bishop pair. And um, mm. if I start trading off all my bishop pairs, it's never <laughs> going to happen. That's true. <laughs> yeah, but you get you get less forks then. Yeah, that's that's a kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also like a bishop pair addict. I always want the bishops, but then I'm sad that I cannot fork so much. Anyway, <laughs> bishop, a, bishop a4 is also the more interesting move. I mean, mm -hmm. just to be honest there. Um, bishop takes c6 is not bad, and I think it's um, a good um, alternative thing to play sometimes. Like if you, because it's easy to learn, right? The, the exchange is you, relatively Chester, for the easy rate. to learn. But mm -hmm. it should more of should be more of a backup thing something that you can play once in a while but bishop a4 is the more interesting move it kind of keeps the the question hanging in the air what black wants to do next and mm -hmm. here there are already some interesting points to consider in some games and actually some is kind of a yeah depending on on the level that you look at if you just look at every level like also like club player online player people play relatively often b5 mm -hmm. here yeah and this is it's not completely terrible but kind of risky yeah white okay. goes back to b3 of course and now the bishop is lined up again like in the italian yeah it's pretty nice it's a good diagonal and we are pretty happy about this because a6 b5 is not just it doesn't help black so much. If we think about it, it's kind of weakening a little bit. So sometimes the move a4 could be a thing, could be annoying. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that b5 never happens. We we'll get to that in a moment, but the timing is kind of kind of difficult for black. They have to be a little bit cautious with playing b5. So yeah. most of the time they play knight f6 now and get this e4 pawn attacked. And this is um, an interesting moment because now white has to make some kind of commitment about the pawn. There are two moves here now for white, um, and I will say that in my upcoming course, uh, I will uh, recommend d3 here, which is kind of a modest move because we are giving up on this idea to play c3 and d4 in one go. Mm -hmm. But it has a huge advantage um, over castling, which is the main continuation. It saves you weeks of learning theory, like weeks <laughs> is a bit much, but but a lot. Yeah. So okay. the thing is, if white castles, which is the more ambitious move for sure, yeah. 
if white castles and ignores that the pawn is hanging, you have to deal with black taking the pawn, which is the thing. I mean, once this pawn is gone, white is not managing the full pawn center anymore. Mm -hmm. It's taken. And this is the start of um, a, a very concrete and kind of tactical almost variation. That's called the open Spanish or the open Rue Lopez. Mm -hmm. White goes d4 here when it's very risky for black to take and all of a sudden it looks very juicy and it's not it's not completely lost or anything but it's very very risky mm -hmm. so black usually goes b5 goes mm -hmm. back and then they make sure that the knight is secured on e4 and then you get a very interesting type of position and very unique in chess it's kind of a very mm -hmm. unique formation. Black has this b5, and it's just a completely different story than the one that we are trying to tell, that we will finally get this d4, e4 pawn. So it's just completely, completely different. Mm -hmm. So black can take, or, sorry, after castles. Um, they have, of course, plenty of other options. And this could be to flick in b5. Now is, is, is a thing, and then develop here, trying to, again, work against um, this expansion or black can play bishop e7 that is the the absolute main move that's for example what was played um multiple times in the last world championship match between magnus and um and uh, nepo i'm just i cannot pronounce the name it's <laughs> impossible <laughs> for me so um yeah so they played this multiple times magnus was playing black in those games mm -hmm. and here White can play rook e1 mm -hmm. and hopes, uh, by the way, um, black is still not worried about this thing because here they can get the pawn back like that. Yes. Yeah. So white goes rook e1 here. <clears throat> That's what Nepo played. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, maybe he played d3 in one game, but usually rook e1 is the idea. Mm -hmm. And now, the rook is covering the pawn and that means white is still hoping to get to c3 d4 in mm -hmm. so now black has to be cautious because we are threatening to win the pawn now on e5 with white so if they guess all that's a big mistake then this is really gone there's no mm -hmm. way that black is getting it back and this is why black goes b5 here that is more or less the only move goes back and now black has to decide what to do they usually castle in this position pretty logical and yeah. white goes c3 to get d4 in and this has been played i know, millions of times a lot yeah really a lot yeah and um here is, is it's, it's a famous position because here black has a, a very crucial decision to make they can play the move d6 that has been played very very often like in particular by strategic players people like Karpov for example he played that tons of times and here white has excellent chances to get d4 in white could play it right away or in many cases they played h3 here to make bishop g4 impossible and then black plays a move pretty much any move let's say bishop b7 and then d4 that is kind of the 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 basic thing that white would want in the roy like you mm -hmm. want that big pawn center always be ready to recapture so the pawns stay this uh, this duel that that's the ideal thing to happen and it will happen a lot if black is doing something imprecise along the way so here we have seen one of the old main lines there's of course an alternative here and i just want to mention it because that is what um makes this whole thing nowadays for the super top level players uh, unattractive black has this move d5 here that's the so-called martial attack you, you maybe heard of that that's pretty famous yeah opening line mm -hmm. but this is a very theoretical thing where white can take and even win a pawn here but black argues that 
they get great compensation, like with an attack. We're getting very deep here uh, in the in the in the theory, but this is an important thing to consider for the top level players. They nowadays more or less think if black is like super precise like that, that it's difficult to get this c3 d4 in. And for example, Nepo in the match, he didn't even play c3 here, but played a4 or h3 a little bit differently when it's more difficult for black to get this d5 in. So the basic idea of the rule of pass is this c3 d4 center and white can be ambitious ambitious and try it in one go with this c3 d4 or that is um, as i mentioned what i'm going to recommend in my course to save lots of theoretical workload i recommend to to go d3 right here so that black doesn't get to capture on e4 and then i say we're going to do this c3 d4 thing just later it's will eventually happen in most games. It just takes longer. So here, for example, black has to worry about the e5 pawn again. So if they play something stupid like this, it's it's again a pawn. Happens a lot, actually. It's kind of surprising. But the best for black is probably to play b5 yeah. to get this bishop takes e6 out of the way and then continue to develop like bishop to c5 bishop to e7 bishop to b7 this kind of thing so let's say bishop e7 that looks pretty logical and now the long-term idea for white is still this c3 d4 but it will take a while so mm -hmm. we will probably castle first play rookie one to cover the pawn and then ultimately go here and get this yeah. um, pawn center established. An interesting point is that you could ask, if you look at this position, um, isn't that somewhat in particular, let's do this, for example, that's a bit a bit simpler to compare. It's also a good move, of course, bishop to c5. You could ask, isn't that very similar to an Italian game? The bishop is on b3 instead of c4. And black gets here. That's an interesting thing to compare if we go back. So let's see, let's say this one, knight f6, d3, bishop c5. So if we just think about this, this looks very similar. Mm -hmm. now, 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 now I have to jump to the right position on chess.com. <laughs> that's going to be uh... the biggest problem of this session. Huh? <laughs> Oh my god, that's a maze of moves. Um, where is it? Bishop c4. Somewhere here? Yeah, almost. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> almost. So, like, almost. So, here. Yeah, it's very similar, right? It's just like the bishop was on c4 in the Italian, yeah. and here it's on b3, mm -hmm. and black has basically been gifted those moves. And yes. the key question. The question can be, is that something that is good for black or not? If this a6, b5 helps. Mm -hmm. One thing does help, the move a6. That is generally often useful because the bishop gets a nice retreat square. It's often helpful. If it's attacked, it has something safe to retreat to. But b5 is actually sometimes a problem for black because white can play a quick a4 and kind of yeah try to prove that this could be weak and this is also what i'm going to recommend in my course to go with the quick a4 and ask some questions like what about this pawn currently it's attacked and black has to do something about it they cannot just ignore the thing and some responses are some responses look look good at first but are not actually that great for example, mm -hmm. you could think that bishop b7 is a thing here that would cover the rook so that a, b, a, b is not blundering stuff. Mm -hmm. But the bishop is actually looking at this pawn, like indirectly. Yeah? It's directed yeah. towards a pawn that is completely covered. And you wonder yeah. if this is doing all that much there. So this giving black this b5 move uh, for free, so to say, um, is also having an upside because it's not completely for free. 
it's a little bit weakening and mm. that gives white some additional ideas so it's not without point that we um, play this like small move d3 and are kind of modest there because we give something uh, to black that is not always going to be helpful so one this is definitely a, an opening variation where black should be fine that i don't want to say that that's great for white and black has a problem also but they have to be kind of kind of cautious it's not an easy thing to play um this early d3 by the way is also like if you look at the very top level they often um actually play this move still because they're not that worried about the knight takes e4 line and after bishop e7 they often play this one too so these early d3 moves in the Rui have become more popular on the top mm -hmm. level because they feel that those long theoretical lines like the marshal that they're all good not good for black in the sense that black is better, but they have no problem. So playing this kind of somewhat modest version of the Rui with d3, I think is a very good starting point in two ways. First of all, it's objectively a good line. Even the mm -hmm. top guys play like that. And it makes uh, the, let's say, the, the barrier to cross is a little bit is a little bit um it's a little bit easier yeah if you go like okay let's castle here and look at all those lines that's really a lot so it's a good idea to play it um in this in this way at first and then later you can always um expand let's say yeah, and and go for for other yeah. ideas that is actually also something that i feel is very um beneficial about learning a basic um, repertoire in the rulo pass you can very easily modify that later it's not like a one-way like a one-way street in a way some some openings are like that let's say you would i'm just throwing it out there let's say you would learn i know some kind of gambit line like this mm -hmm. that is not totally bad but once you get to a certain level people know like the one or two lines that are good against it and then it's mm -hmm. more or less gone you, you cannot really do much about it you have no good ways to let's say um modify it in a way that you can continue playing it and yeah. in the in a real pass or in the italian game i think those openings are just on the same quality level you have lots of um ways to to vary you can play it a little bit different or you can add things to it or just change parts of it it's like not a let's say a one trick pony yeah some of those gambits are like that they are playing for like a trick or some yeah some um they, they kind of hope that black doesn't know what to do and if they do mm, you're kind of you, you're in problems and this is something that um it depends a little bit on the level that you play against but with some of the gambits, um, it, it's really um, at a certain level, it's it's over. You cannot play them successfully anymore. Um, I, I can give you this precise example like this, for example, a friend of mine um, has played this for years, like in the 1980s, 1990s, before like preparation and computers became a thing. And he said like, like 20 years ago, everybody was taking this pawn and then defend like crap and, they, and he had a great position all the time and nowadays like every single person who ever has can switch on a computer it tells you uh no that's no good like d5 is good for black for example it's just one example you can look at all kinds of uh, gambit lines there are there are better ones <laughs> yeah like like this is just an example for example if you look at gambits um like the evans gambit is better or some italian line gambits are also a little bit better but it's it's kind of limited those openings and um in the context of the rule you have lots of ways to 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 vary oh yeah. somebody mentioned the stafford gambit i, re I read that in chat i got an <laughs> alert for him <laughs> yeah don't play the stafford that's really bad so um so okay so like one word about the berlin by the way sure because because it's conceptually really interesting so black attacks the pawn and mm -hmm. it's a bit different to the 
version with a6 and bishop a4 inserted. It's a bit different okay. um, because if we look at the two options that we were talking about, like if you remember, like here, it was d3 and castles we looked yes. at. And now let's look at the Berlin. Okay. Why is that a different thing? First of all, if we castle, which is one of the main moves, black takes here. And now in this version with a6 and bishop a4 included, White plays this d4 move. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back there because it's all it's all very fast, and I know I'm kind of fast there, but like here, yeah. White goes d4 and wants to get this attack going. So let's do this now with knight f6, castles here, and d4. And the big difference is the bishop is still here, and black can play this move attacking the bishop and that is the big difference of those two things mm -hmm. and here after bishop d6 white has nothing better really than taking here on c6 because i mean you can move the bishop but then then black goes e4 yeah yeah so you, you mm -hmm. don't really have much else than the capture yeah. and black takes and white takes here and knight f5 and then we get this famous Berlin endgame. That, that is the variation that cost Kasparov the World Championship title, basically. Oh. Are, are you aware of that story? Like what might happen no. there? Or no, yeah? No, no. So we can we go back to the year 2000 when you were like two <laughs> years old, I guess, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we are going back to the year 2000 when mm -hmm. Kasparov was still the world champion and he played Kromnik, his challenger. Mm -hmm. Like they um, were about even level at the time, but Kasparov was still the favorite, like not a huge favorite, but still a favorite. And it was um, a very much anticipated match because Kromnik had played very successfully against Kasparov before. Mm -hmm. So they had a kind of an even score, but it was always a huge problem for people to play black against Kasparov's E4. He was such a strong attacking player. And in the very first game that um, that was played with Kromnik playing black, he played the Berlin defense. And at the time, nobody played that. It was okay. a total sideline. Nobody knew that this is a thing. And Kasparov played this and they got here. And the problem was that Kasparov thought, and this is not a totally wrong idea, that white should be better in this end game that was the the common knowledge at the time white should be better here and the reasoning is that well black has lost right to castle it looks a bit awkward yeah and yeah everybody thought that white must be better and kasparov also thought that white must be better and he tried all the time to win this end game against kromnik in this match like they played in, uh, i think 18 games total and i think this was played four times five times by kasparov and it was just like banging against the wall this is why it's called berlin wall nowadays okay. yeah and he was n n not getting anywhere like nowhere yeah. and now if we go forward 22 years um if they don't try this end game all that much anymore with white mm -hmm. because it has been pretty much worked out like the top guys at least yeah, they say mm, yeah, white is not really getting that much black has the bishop pair which is a huge mm -hmm. thing so this means that after knight f6 if white castles and black mm -hmm. takes it's kind of difficult for white because they say like this d4 thing is maybe not that promising because of mm -hmm. knight d6 and if you cannot go d4 what, what are you doing they play rookie one that is a thing mm -hmm. and then then you get something like this and this is very far away from white ever getting a full pawn center and making some attack happen that's really mm -hmm. not not yeah. not really happening all that much so this is why castling is it's not a bad move it's just very different to this a6 bishop a4 inserted mm -hmm. 
So what White is often doing, and this is very likely what I'm going to be recommending in my course, I'm still working on that a little bit because it's really a bit difficult here for White to suggest something that is kind of challenging and not um, like a total ordeal to learn. So most of the time they play just d3 still here, mm -hmm. cover the pawn, and then black um, continues. Um, ah, and there's a message in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitch, but just as a guest, I don't really want to maintain an old uh, my own channel, huh? but, but I'm happy to hop on. So and then black usually goes bishop c5 here. And then they play this position. That's kind of comparable to with a6 and bishop a4 inserted. But the main thing is that the Berlin makes castling a little bit more difficult. So because black can take. Yeah. It's kind of interesting if you look at this very broadly conceptually that this quick counterattack against e4 is always kind of the most challenging. So you have the Berlin, you have, oops, sorry, this and this being a challenging option where mm -hmm. the pawn is attacked. And finally, just to make it even more depressing for white, <laughs> there's the Petrov <laughs> when yeah. black also attacks the pawn. So it's kind of interesting to see that all the best defenses, like and we're talking just about, I'm not saying you cannot play anything else, but just if you look at like current uh, theoretical uh, wisdom is the, the best for black seems to be to quickly counter attack the e pawn. Like mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense because if you look at one drawback of e4, it's kind of unprotected. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore like challenging this quickly with this or yeah, like th this is not a coincidence that they all they all look kind of the same. <laughs> those things that goes for a counter attack against e4. But what is interesting, um, and I know you don't play e4, e5 with black, and you don't intend to, right? No, I don't intend to. I'm <laughs> gonna stick with the stick with the French for now. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, what is interesting about this is that and why often it is recommended for uh, for players to play e4 e5 with black at least at some point in their in their chess career is that it kind of it teaches fighting for the center a lot like mm -hmm. this this is kind of instructive that black shouldn't like i don't know uh, do something something passive and kind of allow all this but rather fight for the center so it's it's there is a bit of truth to that that it makes sense to have played e4, e5 at some point. But if you do it with white, like if you're going to play e4 and play um, the Rui, or I mean, I, I'm happy if you do that, but you can also play the Italian. Yeah? Like when I was thinking about writing my repertoire, like mm -hmm. I was um, more or less, um, it was more or less a coin flip between the two moves. They are just equally yeah. good in a way. I'm going to go for the Rue Lopez in my repertoire, mostly for conceptual reasons in the context of the whole repertoire, because I'm covering E4 as a whole, and yeah. I need to suggest stuff against everything. And if you see what I'm doing against C5, I'm just going to show that just real quickly. I'm playing Knight F3, and I'm going to play this and this then it's kind of makes sense that i'm going for the rib because yeah this is conceptually a very similar thing like if you look at knight c6 i'm going to do this mm -hmm. going to castle going to play this and c3 and d4 yeah. so it's kind of the same so i think it it, it, it felt a little bit more consistent to go for the willow pass instead of the italian i think I cannot say Juco Piano, I'm just so terrible. But this is how the classy people say it, I think. I just say Italian. <laughs> you, you, uh, didn't you learn Italian on Duolingo? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm or learning Italian on Duolingo. I am. Is it, is it good? Is that site? Um, is, I never um, use it. Is it, uh, is it good? Yeah, it's good for um, 
kind of conversational stuff and basics, but it, it doesn't teach you languages in like the way you learn at school with um, learning verb endings and grammar and things like that. It's more just phrases and conversational things. So it would be good if you were going on a trip, mm -hmm. but if you really want to learn the language, I think you need to do, you probably need to get extra resources to learn your verbs and grammar and everything. Mm. And you probably have a, a, a really great um, yeah, foundation in grammar due to what, what you learned, right? You, 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 you have a degree in literature, right? In English. Uh... I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also, I did French and Italian at school for quite a while. So um, mm. in terms of learning verb endings and grammar and things like that, um, I've done quite a lot of it. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking for an online resource uh, myself to to learn uh, Slovenian actually, which oh, is wow. a bit more, really? which is a bit more exotic. Yeah, yeah. I'm That's there cool. each year, like uh, or every year, better English, mm -hmm. I think, um, like once or twice. And I've been there like 15 times or so, and I'm not uh, better than knowing. I don't know. I know what like Saturday is, or can say hello, but I'm really terrible. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, I was thinking it would be it would be nice to at least have a little bit of basic understanding mm -hmm. of the language. But it's um, like from looking at it on a very um, superficial level, like it's a Slavic language. Obviously, it's yeah. very cl it's closer to other uh, Balkan languages. It's relatively far away from uh, what is this? Um, is that Romantic? Is that the right word? Yeah, like, Romance like Spanish, Italian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're they're kind of similar, and you you kind of can you can put it together a little bit. Like I mean, I don't understand Italian, but if you see an Italian sentence, you sometimes can piece it yeah. together a little bit at least. Yeah, and I learned mm -hmm. Latin at school and so on, but like Slovenian is really really diff uh, different. Yeah, and you just see a sentence like, okay, that can be anything, you know, from <laughs> whatever. Yeah, it could I be. I wouldn't know where to start. You should yeah. see if they have it on Duolingo because then you could at least get like the very mm. basics and then you could do yeah. the harder grammar stuff later on once you know a yeah. couple of vocab I, They words. don't have it. I checked it because oh, really? Duolingo, yeah, Duolingo was something that I I knew of that this is a resource, but yeah. they didn't have it. So um, I tried to oh. find um, find this resource there. I've heard good things about Babbel. Uh, I think ah, okay. Um, I, I'll send it to you. I haven't tried it myself. Okay, yeah, that, that would be nice. I mean, I don't. I, I mean, I don't really think I have the the patience to do the full. Um, yeah, yeah like sure. learn the basic grammar and so on. But mm -hmm. it would be just nice to, to to say a little bit more than "Dobry dan," "Guten Tag," yeah, uh, "Hello," <laughs> "Nice to meet you." Mm -hmm. I, I cannot do anything anything else. Yeah, I mean, and and you usually get along in that country well with English and German because yeah. the older people tend to speak German, they had it in school, and the younger people can speak English. Yeah? So it's not like yeah, you're not uh, starving there because you cannot order uh, at a restaurant. But it's <laughs> really nice. Okay, so I think we have done lots of basic, basic things yeah. now. Um, mm -hmm. I think I probably have completely confused you, but uh, maybe you have questions or something that we should look at <laughs> yeah. more deeply or anything like um, that? I didn't find it too confusing. What do you mm. have like, um, the, the answer to this is probably going to be no, but is there some straightforward way to reach a familiar position if they play the Petrov or do you have to learn Petrov theory? Yeah, there's no other way of doing it. You have okay. to pick one one line there okay. that you that you can play i mean in the in the petrov um you the the type of play in the petrov mm -hmm. is a bit not not a bit it's fundamentally really different to mm -hmm. the Rue Lopez because okay. in the Rue, what is what is nice about it what i really like about it is and this is almost it's it's actually similar in the italian game is that um, you have kind of a default thing that you can do. Like if mm -hmm. if you are really confused and you don't know, okay, what, what exactly is happening, you can always say, okay, I'm going to like cover this pawn with d3, I'm going to castle, yeah. I'm going to play my rook to e1. Like I can show you something very basic that would basically always work. Like something like this would be the starting moves. And now pretty much 
it doesn't really matter what black does. Let's say I'm, I'm making some moves, yeah? Just like d6. Mm -hmm. We want some castle at some point. We should be seven. We're going to play c3 for two reasons. At some point, we want to play d4. And mm -hmm. we want to make sure that we can retreat the bishop if it gets chased around. And you have always this idea, just so, kind of this. Yeah, like okay. we start out with this. The knight has this. That, that's really called the Rue Lopez knight tour, by the way. It's a, <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> the knight okay. goes to c3. And mm -hmm. it has a purpose. It covers e4. Mm -hmm. This knight covers d4. Yeah. So after all these moves, we would be ready to play d4. Let's say bishop d7, and we go d4. Mm -hmm. It has taken a while, but, but we managed this. And this kind of setup, like get the knight to g3, yeah, you need rook e1 for that so that the knight can go to f1. And this is kind of a default setup. Like it's it's almost, um, I mean, I know it's a bit mean, but people make fun of the London system. But mm -hmm. this is kind of the thing. If, if white plays the London system and like mm -hmm. autopilot, this bishop f4 yeah. and e3 and so on, this is kind of what you do here if you if you don't know what else to do, let's say. or And often it's just good. It, may, it makes sense. The knights support the center ultimately, and with d4, we get where we wanted to, to be from the very beginning. So this is also, as you see, um, there's no trade. There's not a single pawn traded, not a single piece traded. And the big difference to the bedrock is, I mean, they attack our pawn, and it gets very concrete all of a sudden. So mm -hmm. you have to decide, do we take this pawn or yeah, do we play something else? Of course, you mm -hmm. could cover the pawn, but this is a totally different thing from the Rui, where c3, yeah. d4, you know. Sure. So at the end, you probably end up taking the pawn or play d4. Those two moves are mostly played. Mm -hmm. And okay. why takes? Yes, there is a Stafford. Somebody mentioned that. But it's really not great, not going there. But most of the time, <laughs> that would happen. And then you get this thing. And here, it's a starting point where white can choose one of many possible lines. Like, mm -hmm. this is the thing, yeah, or d4 mm -hmm. is the main move. It's really something where you would uh, pick one variation okay. and look at this a little bit. It's, it's pretty sure. concrete. And it's not so much of a, a setup thing where like in the mm -hmm. Rui, we have this kind of default thing to develop. It's really like yeah. looking at some variations. And honestly, um, I'm currently um, still working on the Petrov chapter in my course, mm -hmm. because like I have, uh, I, know, I know it sounds scary, but I have like 30 chapters. It's pretty, <laughs> in total, it's 30. Yeah. Keep and um, but each, yeah, no, but what I did is in, in no, it's really, it's, it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. In the first edition, I had much less. I had like, yeah. like 10 or so or, or 12, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But they um, ended up being relatively large single chapters. Yeah. And that makes it, I think, more difficult to study. So what I did is I made more splits. And I think that makes it easier to digest basically like it's not as much yeah, no, in right. one in one thing so um i have of those 30 chapters i have completed like 23 or something or 22 and mm -hmm. it's uh, it happens that i'm not done with those like i'm completely uh finished with like french and modern and caro khan and so this is all completely done and in some of those like in the petro for example i cannot even tell you what i'm going to recommend because i'm currently looking at various things so okay yeah but it's this is not very intimidating actually um if you look at uh, the typical opposition that that you face i mean you're not uh, Magnus trying to break down uh, Nepomiachi's mm -hmm. computer uh, assistive preparation. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's uh, just a different thing. So mm -hmm. um, it's totally fine to look at something here and then go for it. And it's fine. Like, for example, um, when I looked at this with students for years, I always recommended playing Knight C3. And I might end up recommending this in my course too. I'm not sure yet. Um, the idea is that black usually takes here, 
when white takes with the D pawn to get yeah. the development sped up. And now the idea is pretty simple. You can put the bishop here or an f4, play queen d2, castle queen side, and then, yeah, like attack later. Yeah. It is a fairly straightforward plan. And mm -hmm. it works very well, actually, unless black is like Nepo, yeah, and knows everything. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this is sometimes a difficult consideration um, if I'm writing a course. Like, you have to look at what what are the top guys playing, which is kind of, it is kind of relevant because it's like the objective truth in a way, but mm -hmm. it is not the thing that you're going to face in games all that much. Quite mm -hmm. often people play differently or there are there are pitfalls that they don't know or things like that. So when sometimes people say, um, oh, this line is not so great because there's this and that complicated thing, that is um, not super relevant for mm -hmm. for normal people. And I mean, I mean, including like like me as an I am, like if I play in a league game and I play someone of my level, they don't know that much like it's not like everybody is doing computer assisted preparation till move 20 something that's mm -hmm. really not happening all that much so we have to be realistic there and i always try to find if i'm writing uh, such a course to find some balance so that it's usable for for most people still a bit challenging so it's not like super simplistic i mean you can always simplify things to the point where nobody needs a book anymore because there's just not, nothing in there right <laughs> that, that also makes no sense yeah? you want to kind of find a balance yeah and there are some questions i think uh, it looks yes there was a question about playing h3 and preventing black from playing bishop g4 in the roy lopez um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that depends a lot on the concrete position, mm -hmm. because there are plenty of versions there. A famous one is the, oops, sorry, it's kind of leggy here, bishop a4, castles. We've been there, like in this, this. Um, this is a very famous position where um, and that was the before the Berlin and the Marshall attack were becoming more popular. That was the absolute main position of the Rue Lopez. And here, this move c3 is the main move. And it looks a bit mysterious because you think hmm, there must be something more urgent to do than playing the spawn here. But what White is arguing is that after d4, black can go bishop to g4 and okay. put this pin into place. And this is a little bit annoying indeed, because what is white doing now? Black is threatening to capture, and you don't want that double pawn, that would be pretty ugly, and queen takes would blunder the d4 pawn. So mm -hmm. you don't have such a great move here for white. I mean, what white is usually doing here is playing d5, which can be done, it's not a mistake or anything, but it's it doesn't look so great. Like yeah. the bishop mm, had better ideas for the day. Um, or white can play a funny move, bishop e3, because this is falling into a funny. Oh, wow. It's funny, huh? Yeah. yeah. yeah the, the, the funniest thing is, is actually that it doesn't win a piece because black has, has this funky idea to get it back but okay we're getting getting into really <laughs> <laughs> really weird stuff but this is the thing this bishop g4 idea can be annoying and this is why most of the time white invests his tempo and mm. then d4 this is however um, a pretty specific thing here the move h3 is not always um, necessary for white to play so if we, for example, say we had, I think I, I went here somewhere, like when I showed you this kind of default setting, like this, 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 you can play this move. It's kind of, this is what I usually call a like convenience move. Yeah, it's just like, man, it feels good to have it. Yeah? So nothing comes to G4, you're not getting back mated and so on, but it doesn't have this, 
<coughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't have this very concrete idea. It's just like, as it's a slow position, mm -hmm. and getting this in is, is kind of useful, but not essential. Okay. Like here, for example, if black pins here, that's not really a thing, because or not really a problem, because it's not like we, we are not on d4 with the pawn, so there's no indirect pressure on it. And white could always play, let's say, h3, they keep the pin, and then you go here, and ultimately, they have to do yeah. something with the bishop. And mm, like retreat to g6, not ideal, take on f3, very much not ideal. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a threat, bishop g4. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But often white plays h3 anyway, yeah, because, well, you can. It's a slow position. And mm, yeah, it's often good to have them move in. So, um, what? Uh, yeah, h3 is a common move. Yeah, that's true. To read mm -hmm. the chat. Um... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we we got there. We had we 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 we, we done those. Yeah. So. Um, when you want to build a repertoire with e4, e5, and knight f3, mm -hmm. um, you mostly have to look at those two. There are some rarer moves here, but they are not so challenging or relevant. I think that would be easily done. For the Petrov, I would suggest something relatively simple, not too sophisticated, because quite often, mm, black also won't know it that well. And in the Rui, I think, I mean, you don't have to, but these early D3 lines have the advantage of being, yeah, easier to learn at first. Yeah, so I would always suggest doing that. And they are still somewhat challenging. It's not like nobody plays that. It's like you find tons of games by people, like everybody. Magnus Carlsen, Caruana, they all play. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, yeah, thanks for having me on the on, on your stream, on your show. Yes, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Okay, yeah, thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, Christoph. See you soon.